It was followed by Marathi with 97, Tamil with 83, Hindi with 70, Kannada with 66, and Telugu with 62. Other languages also followed. Malayalam had not more than 20 representations there. These included faithful translations, prose renderings, and free adaptations. So when we look at the uh, Shakespeare translation, we may have to look at a couple of things. One, what is the Shakespeare that is getting translated? If we look at the history of uh, Shakespeare translations, we find that Shakespeare himself was translated into English language in England by Englishmen. About after 50 years of his life, he died in, as we know, in 16, 16, he died, 16, 16, he died, almost 50 years after that. And for the next 50 years, we find adaptations of Shakespeare in English language. An example is, as we all know, the Dryden's The Tempest, where Caliban is given a partner, Ariel is given a partner, and so on. He adapts Shakespeare freely. About a hundred years after that, from about uh, 1764, there was a change. They wanted to discover the original Shakespeare. So people went back to the original Shakespeare. Of course, we know that from uh, 1523, we have the first folio and so on, up to the fourth folio. But after that, the, the movement died because of the influence of the adaptations of Shakespeare in English language itself. So, by 19, sorry, 1764, uh, just before that, there was a movement to rediscover Shakespeare. So new editions of Shakespeare came out. So important scholars like Edward Malone came up, Dr. Johnson came up, and they edited Shakespeare, Pope. So all these people edited Shakespeare, and there was a new kind of scholarship of Shakespeare editions. By 1813, they discovered one thing, that Shakespeare's old language is intimidating, even for Englishmen. So they tried to change Shakespeare's language into contemporary language of theirs. And they brought out simplified versions of Shakespeare. There were two movements very important. One was Charles Lamb's edition of Shakespeare, a Tales from Shakespeare, it's not edition. Charles Lamb and Mary Lamb, they collaborated to bring out the Shakespeare uh, plays for children. For the young people, that's what they said. And for the family, Bowdler and his sister brought out another edition. The Bowdler Shakespeare, or what we call, or what they call the family Shakespeare, and what we call the Bowdler edition of Shakespeare, in, from which they purged the portions which they thought were not morally correct or not conducive for <clears throat> a reading aloud in a family. So these two editions from 1807 or 1809 onwards was the version or were the versions that got transmitted to the Indian or the colonial spaces when English education started. It was not the original Shakespeare. So what got translated during the translation phase of Shakespeare is a confusing issue. Whether they translated from the quarto editions, folio editions, or from Lamb, or from Bautler, or from the other many editions of Shakespeare is an interesting question. So whatever it is, these translations, whether they adopted Shakespeare as such, or from the translations, they certainly influenced the literary policy system of the target languages. The, uh, another thing that we have to understand when Shakespeare translation is done is, Shakespeare, as we know, is written in two formats. One, I mean, Shakespeare, almost all plays of Shakespeare, we come across, there are some poetic passages, 
there are some prose passages or what we call the blank verse and the prose passages. So how do we translate these blank verse passages? And then there are simply poems and simple poems in Shakespeare. There are many poems in Shakespeare's plays. How do we translate them? So poems, the blank verse passages, which are actually spoken expressions or normal speech. And third, the prose passages in Shakespeare. How do they translate? So when I translate it to, into Malayalam, for example, or to Hindi, how should I translate it? Should I translate poetry as poetry? Blank verse? Well, how can I translate blank verse in the, into an Indian metrical form or prose passages? And the local connotations, especially in the comic passages, there are so many local connotations, which actually creates the element of you know, fun in that. How do we translate that? So we are going to look at a couple of these things in this uh, sometime that we have at, your, at our disposal. So polysystem is an interconnected collection of stratified elements which constitute the system. Once again, this is not my definition. This is um, the definition of uh, Itamar Ivensahar, who comes to a, who, who proposed the, the polysystem theory, or one of the leading proponents of the polysystem theory. Translate, uh, polysystem is an interconnected collection of stratified elements which constitute it. It changes as its constituting elements interact with one another. None of these elements are fixed forever. They keep on changing. So uh, such a view of literature can account for the evolution of literary systems. We can say that language changes, language adapts. Language moves, such so do, so does literature. This view, which began in the 1920s with the Russian formalism, became a very prominent view by the 1970s, and it is still being uh, improved and being debated and discussed much around the world. It is a descriptive approach to translation theory, and it helps one to examine how foreign texts have shaped our literary repertoire of a particular literary system. Translations of plays, uh, sorry, translation plays a fundamental role in a nation's literary and cultural history. For example, most of the Indian regional languages and literatures are not even conscious of the role of Sanskrit in shaping their literary cultures. Similarly, English literature has also played a major role in shaping the literary cultures of several languages and cultures across the world. As Shakespeare is one of the important authors in English literature, his translations into local and regional languages have played a significant role in the development of regional language and literatures. This is especially so in the case of uh, languages and nations which were once under the British imperial power. So according to polysystem theory, literature is a part of social, cultural, literary, and historical framework. And it sees literary works not in isolation, but as a part of a system. So a work that appears in Tamil today is not a part of Tamil alone, but because it has got several influence of the other languages. Some languages, may, some literary systems may resist it. If the literary system as such is a very strong one, the permission of or the influence of the external or translated literatures may be slow. In some literatures, which may be very strong, it doesn't mean that the system is weak, but it all depends on how a literary system receives other uh, literatures. So, for example, uh, the literary system A, for example, influences a literary system B. When the literary works from A gets translated and reach B, this makes native literatures and translated literatures constantly struggle for the survival and domination within every literary system. And perpetually, they are engaged in this kind of a struggle. 
Zohar points out that a polysystem is a network or relations that can be hypothesized for a certain set of assumed observables. That means it is a const it is it is a constant tension generated by the opposition between the canon represented by the models entrenched in the center of on the one hand of the source of, uh, source language or the or, or the or the literary system of a language and the non-canonized but new and innovative models emerging at the periphery on the other this guarantees the evolution of the system as zohar says which only means its preservation which is the only means of its preservation the evolution of a system of a literary system is the only means of its preservation had a literary system been preserving its original kind of writing say for example sanskrit literature uh, lives on only with the kind of poetry that ramayana was written in or any literature or english literature survives with what we call the the old english poetic literature that literature would not survive so it is the change brought in by the multiple influences of various literary systems onto a particular literary system that helps it grow and translated literature normally appears at the periphery of this if we take it as a circle it's the periphery of it the translated literature often is positioned but they are in a constant tension to come to the center of the system and if they want to come to the center of the system the one in the center has to be pushed out so zahar says uh, uh, the central position uh, in situations when a literature is uh when if when it comes to the central position it can come to the central position when the literature when the local literature is the, there are three possibilities he says one it is in the process of being established and is young and not at crystallized second when the the peripheral within the large group or weak when it is either weak or it is peripheral the local literature itself is peripheral or the local literature itself who is weak then the it is possible that the the other literatures the foreign translated literatures can come to the center of it or it is also possible when the literature is a, I mean when the culture when the literary culture itself is at a turning point or it is undergoing a crisis or if there is a literary vacuum it feels so under these three conditions it can come so how did shakespeare come to us that's an interesting question every literary system has both original text as well as translated text obviously shakespeare is for us translated text within every literary polis system there are different literatures genres and translated works and original works which constantly compete for the central position of course shakespeare is also one such text which is trying to compete which is competing to come to the central position any of these can be can come to the center or go to the periphery shakespeare can be pushed to the, to the periphery or it can occupy the central position for example for a long time in the indian academy we find that shakespeare occupied the central position in all the english departments but we also know right now that is not the case translated literature can help a literary system develop and become serviceable as a literary language through the introduction of new styles uh, there are cases when literature occupies a peripheral position in such situations it will have no major influence in the central system which is the native literature then translated literature at the margins will attempt to conform to the norms of the native literary system this is important when uh, the the foreign literature cannot influence the native literature much the foreign literature will conform to the native literature or the styles of the native literature and the, it is in this position that we, we we find shakespeare in india 
this perif peripheral position is normal in trans for a translated literature. That is where we find Shakespeare. We will see a couple of examples and then we will uh, understand it better. <clears throat> so Shakespeare translations provided many languages across the world with models for literary language. And Shakespeare has helped them develop secular literary language. Even uh, in the 18th and early 19th centuries, this was the case. And even in the French literature uh, of Canada, we find that uh, Shakespeare helped the French part of Canadian literature to de-dialectize that particular Quebecois uh, and prove that it's a language of its own right. So when Shakespeare gets translated into a language, it's also a proof that that language is worthy of being translated, uh, or that what language is worthy enough to translate a Shakespeare's text into it because it, Shakespeare tests literary merit. This is the not mine. My, my, uh, this is not what I say. This is said by major translators of Shakespeare: Sanjay in Malayalam, Harivan Rai Bachchan in English, sorry in Hindi, and so so many others have said that. We will come to that. In many languages, Shakespeare translations have been have been used to fill the gaps in existing literary system. When political regimes change, translations facilitate the production of politically acceptable literary texts. The promotion of classics in translation, especially of Shakespeare, during the Nazi regime is an ex example. Nazis exempted Shakespeare, although they excluded most of the foreign drafts. Similarly, Soviet Russia also considered translation of classics important, but it considered the proletariat as a sole heir to all the best in literary treasures of the world and so accepted Shakespeare. The study of Shakespeare translation extends the study of the canonical texts in literature. Shakespeare translations have two major issues. First, Shakespeare is treated as canonical text, so he is to be translated faithfully. Second, his stage performances are flexible. They change always. And so they are receptive to change. No performance of Shakespeare is similar. No performance is identical. So what is it that we are translating? When we say we translate Othello, are we translating the text of Othello in the first folio? Or the performance of Othello by Shakespeare's stage? Unfortunately, we don't have the any return of uh, any any video records or any portraits of a, of a performance of uh, Othello by Shakespeare's men that was 400 years ago or 450 years ago so we don't have any record of that so what do we have what we have is modern adaptations of Shakespeare or modern faithful performances of Shakespeare by different company even if we take that we find that the way a player articulates a sentence or performs a particular scene significantly alters the meaning of the text. So on a stage, and because this is because on a stage, an actor enjoys a certain freedom. And Shakespeare performer enjoys greater freedom, unlike his translator who is expected to be faithful. So I translated a couple of texts, and I found always criticized for deviating from the original. Now, this is a permanent problem of the translator. Uh, translation being a definitive activity, unlike acting which gets repeated, is repeatedly assessed, retrieved, scrutinized, and criticized several times. In most languages, Shakespeare was introduced first through a third language. This is also very interesting. Shakespeare was introduced not through English, but through some other language. A classic case, is the Arab translations of Shakespeare, which were made from French translations of Shakespeare by Grand 
Frank or Duzi. Duzi's translations were themselves not from English, but he translated or he adapted these plays from Le Tournier's uh, French translations of Shakespeare. It was only much later that Shakespeare got translated from English into Arabic. So look at this. Shakespeare, when we, when we speak about translations, we often don't get the translations of the original, but translations of translations. Just like what we have today. For example, in Malayalam, we find that, you know, in Kerala, this is every time when a, a, a Nobel Prize in literature is announced, all the text of that particular writer gets translated and is made available in, in Malayalam. But then uh, when we look at the text, we find that, say, for example, it is not from Swedish or it is not from Finnish or it is not, may not be even from French that they are translated, but they are translated from English. So it is a second version that we get. Therefore, can we say that it is original? So look at Shakespeare's translations in Arabic, for example. These Arabic translations were made from French by a writer whose translations, whose adaptations were not made from English itself, but from French. Lucy's translation came from Tonya's translation. And this gives a certain amount of freedom for the Arabs to experiment. For example, I'll give you an example of the, um, the case of Othello, for example. The culture of the intermediary language also defines a literature's approach to Shakespeare. A curious case, as I told you, is the dagger that is used to kill Desdemona in the Arab translations. In English, English plays, uh, Desdemona is not killed with a dagger. She is smothered with a pillow. Now, in, if you go to Arab translations or the early Arab translations, she is, mother, she is not smothered with a pillow, rather she is tapped to death. Because the French found it very crude and barbaric to use pillow to smother a woman. They preferred to give her a sudden death with a knife. The Arabs also thought it is manly to use a dagger and not you know, to use a pillow to smother a a hapless woman. So this somehow conditions your approach to Shakespeare. In the early phase, many languages translated Shakespeare from the abridged version, as we've already discussed. An example is the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Korean translations of Shakespeare. They were made from Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare of 1809. In India also, this is the case. The early translations of India came from Lamb. These indirect translations had a huge influence on local literary cultures. Indians who were introduced to Lambs and Bowdler Shakespeare through educated educational system transmitted the sanitized versions of Shakespeare and they never looked at the complexities of Shakespeare's language and other textual uh, issues by studying the original till much late. Later, when the original sources were made available, Shakespeare discourses and scholarship became more credible in India. That's why in the early phase, we don't have a credible Shakespeare scholarship in India. And most of the scholarship in Shakespeare was like memorizing Shakespeare or like expanding Shakespeare or like giving a, a kind, good commentary on a Shakespeare's play. But the kind of scholarship, the Western scholarship, which resulted out of studying the original text of Shakespeare, did not exist in, uh, our, our, in India in the early phase. So these faithful translations can be produced only when the target literature becomes mature. While theater and cinema moved from foreignization to localization, it seems to be the other way in print. It's very interesting. When the theater moves away from the original to a kind of you know, adaptation of their own. But in print, we started with adaptations, in India especially, we started with adaptations, and now we are graduating into the kind of scholarship that we have. 
Um, one of the reason is that Indian idea of translation. In, in India, the kind of the idea that we had about translation is quite different from the Western idea of translation. In the West, they focused more on faithfulness or the mechanical rigor of translation. But in India, translation was a convenient way of putting it in our own words, an idea in our own words, maybe expanding with our own ideas. That is why we have Ramayana, the sacred text of India, has got many versions in India. A.K. Ramanujan has written about a good, a great, famous essay, and now controversial, 300 Ramayanas. Uh, there are other scholars who are studying about many Ramayanas. This is possible. Sachidanandan has written a beautiful essay on the Ramayanas in the Indian tradition, in the, in the tribal tradition. Of course, in Tamil Nadu, for example, the Kamba Ramana is a totally different kind of a reading from the Valmiki Ramayana. So we have, in the same way, Shakespeare text becomes, became a kind of such kind, subject of such kind of translations in India in the beginning. But now, because of the scholarship in translation studies, we now try to look at how faithful a translation can be, partly because we are trying to create a corpus of translated texts to suit mechanical translations or the computer mediated translations. So most of the major Indian languages in the world have great Shakespeare translations. He appeared in China. I may give you the story of a couple of other languages also. In China, Ling Shu's adaptations of the Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare was titled The Wit of a poet in 1904. Remember, in China also, Shakespeare did not come as his place, rather it came through Lamb. Lin Shu, who did not know English at all, relied on the interpretation of another scholar, Wei Li, who collaborated with him, and he also translated Hamlet. Look at the title of Hamlet. When it goes to Chinese, it is called the Ghost's Command, the Command of the Ghost. And Macbeth, the ghost enchantment. There they focus on the witches. The first one, um, uh, Macbeth, uh, sorry, Hamlet the senior's ghost is focused. In Twelfth Night, it becomes a marriage strategy. Romeo and Juliet is called the committing the crime of passion. These appealed to the local readers in the local context. That is why they gave such titles and the focus of the translation was like that. So they adapted the place in such a way that that's the Eastern way of handling a text. When uh, the Jataka stories from India traveled to other parts of the world and comes back to India, we get a totally new story. For example, the story of uh, uh, the um, it is even said in the Tamil story, uh, Tamil, Tamil classics, the, the mongoose and the serpent in, in, in the Panjadandra stories. When it goes around and it comes back to us, the serpent and the mongoose get changed into something else, the dog and the bear. Lilwain and the dog. That's the English story. It went from here to uh, the Persian stories. From there, it goes to the Arab stories. From there, it goes to the um, Greek stories, to Roman stories, to German. And then it travels down to French and to English. And then the story gets translated something uh, as becomes something else. And here, the hunter comes and shoots. While in India, the woman puts throws the, the pot of water onto this mongoose and the mongoose dies. But that is not, look at the transformation of the story. In the same way, Shakespeare also gets translated, which also goes, undergoes a great transformation. Uh, in French, where we discussed, uh, using the intermediate translation of Lotunier, uh, Laplace and Ducey, uh, who didn't know English produced place. 
uh, Hamlet, for example, Romeo and Juliet, King Lear, Macbeth, Othello, and their popularity made the Ducey's versions become a source of not only the Arab translations, but a translation source for translation of in several European languages also. The way he is interpreted in many Arab and European countries were because of Ducey's Hamlet and not because Shakespeare's Hamlet. For example, the Hamlets in Italian language, in Spanish, in Dutch, in Swedish, in German are all made from Ducey's translation, that is Ducey's French translation, which itself was a translation of the French play by Letounier. So how many deviations are there? But this did not stop the world from translating Shakespeare's Hamlet in French, in uh, Russian, in Swedish, Dutch, Spanish, and Italian languages. He goes through Ducey's French translation. But fortunately in India, that was not the case. In India, because of the British education, we got introduced to uh, English Shakespeare rather early, and we got him translated into English, but not into all languages. Some languages, they translate from other languages. For example, Romeo and Juliet in Canada, the three major productions of Canada, uh, Shakespeare, they were translated not from uh, English, but from the Telugu versions of it. But that's very interesting, or the Urdu versions of it. That's very interesting. Uh, then what is the importance of uh, uh, Shakespeare in uh, the world languages? Or is there any impact of the world literature on Shakespeare? This is an interesting question. It's not that Shakespeare introduced in, in, had an impact on world literature. What is the impact of world literature on Shakespeare is another interesting question that we can ask. Uh, there are a number of allusions. There are, there are a number of stories. For example, I will show you a slide, which I don't know whether I can uh, have the expertise enough to show that. I'll try to show you a slide which will help you to understand how much of Uh, am I sharing my screen now? Can you see that, Dr. Anjana? Is there your screen okay. shared? Yes, yes, I, I will, I'll come to that. So look at this place. This place, uh, you, will, you will find the titles from Shakespeare, for example. Uh, from as you like it, these are the titles taken. For example, Under the Greenwood Tree by Thomas Hardy. We know it's a famous novel, but it is a phrase from as you like it. From Hamlet, we have so many titles. In Julius Caesar, so many titles. King John, King Lear, Macbeth. You can see the list of, of plays there. It's not only that. I mean, these are the important ones. And then if you look at it, there are many, many, many plays. I mean, I'm just taking the titles of the novels in English, in which Shakespeare was translated. I mean, some, some of the titles taken from Shakespeare's plays or related to Shakespeare or which evokes Shakespeare. I'm just giving you a few of them. Uh, then if we go further, uh, I, I don't, I'm, I can speak about that, but that's not our, our main point. So if we historicize Shakespeare translation in the context of India, we can see that both Shakespeare and the very idea of translation arrived in India along with the British. It is very interesting. Both Shakespeare arrived in, in India along with the idea of translation because both these came to us with the British. Before the British, obviously there was no Shakespeare in India, but also 
there was no translation in India in the sense that we understand by the word translation today. We had a number of retellings, of course, as we have already discussed, the Ramayana and the Puranas, and our expectations of the retellings were radically different from those that occupy, uh, the, uh, those that, uh, which concern the people who are looking at translations today or the business of translation. We are more certain that Shakespeare came to India together with the British, but not simultaneously with the British. He was still living in India in 1600 when the East India Company was being founded. When the company did not make much impact in India much later. When the East India Company came to India, Shakespeare was living and it is claimed that there was a certain Captain William Keeling whose men played Shakespeare three times, including the play Hamlet, on the board of the ship, in which the, the ship is called Red Dragon, in 1607, when the ship was sailing to India. It touched, uh, we know for certain, it touched Surat, it touched Calicut, it came to Tamil Nadu area, some port in Tamil Nadu area. This much we know. So that ship in 1607, as the Journal of Captain Keeling says, it played Shakespeare on the board in 1607. So that means Shakespeare could have reached, or the players who had Shakespeare performed Shakespeare on the ship and perhaps on the shore also if they had come in, in, into India, for maybe for their own entertainment. But he came only after the British who had been India after the East India Company was established and asserted itself in India. We know that from the 1770s, they had uh, uh, the Calcutta Theatre. They, they, they have built up the Calcutta Theatre there by the 1770s. You know, even in the 1750s, uh, they say that Shakespeare was being played at Calcutta. But it was after three major incidents that the British got entrenched in India and the Shakespeare became very prominent. One is the defeat of Tipu Sultan at the hands of the British in 1799. Second, the Battle of Patpatganj when the Mughals were defeated by the British in 1803. And the third, the British treaty with the Rajputs in 1800, and, which culminated in 1890. Since then, it was a different story. By 1813, they introduced uh, the British system of education was being introduced. Even from the 1790s, it started, but official confirmation came in 1813 when the charter was renewed. So the question of translation of Shakespeare translation is intriguing. If who could translate these plays into Indian languages? We know that the first translation of Shakespeare into Indian languages is made by an Englishman. His name was Moncton, Charles or Claude Moncton. In the early 1800s, he made this translation in the Fort William College in Calcutta. It was an exercise, it was a linguistic exercise, when at that time they believed in the grammar translation method of teaching language. And this was an exercise Moncton made as a part of his uh, language study. So he translated uh, Shakespeare's uh, play, The Tempest, into Bengali language in 1805. We have the records of it, but we don't have the translation in the uh, company reports or the report of the uh, Calcutta College. We have records of it. Moncton translated this play. But we don't know anything more than that. Then there's a long gap about uh, Shakespeare translations in India. Of course, somebody might have translated Shakespeare because these translations were important for teaching language. So plays were translated from the local languages to English, and English plays were translated from English to, or in literary works were translated from English to local Indian languages, so that these became teaching material for the British men who came and learned local languages and became officers in the company. And also these were used to educate, educate Indian students in Indian schools. 
or, or the, uh, where English was being taught. So one of the theoretical questions is this. Who needs these translations? Who needed these translations? How does a monolingual person, that is, someone who know, does not know the original, but only reads the translated text, judge a translation? How can I say, if I know only Malayalam, how can I say this translation of Shakespeare into Malayalam is a good translation? Of course, I need to know both the languages. How does, how can I make out then uh, whether the translation is good or not? It was only in the latter half of the 19th century that many translations in Indian language began to be done. In the 12th century, there were so many elite and educated people who were already reading Shakespeare in English and did not need a translation. So who needed this translation? Very, very few people. Because anyone who wanted to and needed to read Shakespeare had read him in the original itself. So the next question is about the translation is how faithful is a translation? The word faithful is a very deceptive word as we know. And it's also an inaccurate word in the context of translation or especially in Indian translation. All translations even the most faithful of translations are departures from the original text because the connotation of each language is different. For example, if you say God in English, it can be translated into Indian languages either as Bhagavan, Ishwar, Allah, or, or other, other words. But this will not mean the same thing as God in English at all. Because these words have different theologies, different histories, different connotations, different contexts, different devotees, and different takers and different meanings. So one interesting thing about Shakespeare translations in India is that most translations are free translations. They are adaptations, localized translations. And this was so in most, almost all Indian languages until the year 1910 to 1920. What happened during that period? That was a time when the Indian nationalist movement became very strong. So from 1910s or 1920s to 1947 to 1950, we find very few translations in Hindi language. Before that, there were so many translations. In most of the languages, that was the case. Uh, after that period, that is after 1950, it picked up. But before that, it declined during that specific period. Uh, one of the reasons is, as we know, is the anti-British attitude, which have rubbed on to English and also on to Shakespeare. But after independence, that is not the case. Indians became more confident in taking on Shakespeare. And this taking on after 1950s was on their own terms. So we find Shakespeare used in the um, what we call the Parsi plays or the Marathi plays in, in the 1800s and the 1900s, early, early part, of, part of it. But they were mostly literal takes on Shakespeare. Or they were also adaptations. There are different uh, reasons why they were promoted during that time. But from 1920s to 1940s, the number of the plays dwindled or they were used for some other purpose. So when Shakespeare comes to Indian language, when we talk about Shakespeare into any of the Indian languages, especially of the 19th century when it begins, the also translated Shakespeare had more than Shakespeare in their mind during this period. They had the idea of subversion or subservience or conformation or confrontation or faithfulness or explicitation in Shakespeare translations in India during that time. Let me give you an example. One of the early examples um, we find in Bharati and Harishchandra. Harishchandra Harishchandra translated the play, um, The Merchant of Venice. The Merchant of Venice, as we know, is can be the title itself can easily be translated as Venice Kevyavari or Venish Nagarki Vanik 
or something like that can be translated. But Harishchandra translated the play. The title of the play itself is different. He, said, he translated the play by the title Durlap Bandhu, Rare Friend, in 1880. And this translation, why we say that the, the idea of translation during that time was one of adaptation was that the local culture influenced these translators so much that these translators could only see this foreign play in Indian context. The this actually the, this this phrase Durlab Bandhu comes from the story again from Panchatantra. There is the story of um, two friends and one uh, and there is this particular phrase where, where, where you know uh, uh, one speaks about a good friend. This 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 particular expression comes comes there. All kinds of good people are rare. But the rarest of the rare is a friend who sacrifices everything he has for the sake of a friend. Durlabhaha Gunino Shura. It begins like that and it ends like Mitrarthe Vekti Sarvasu Bantu Sarvaihisu Durlabha. It is from that this Durlabha Bandhu, rare friend, this expression comes up. The story of Merchant of Venice is actually the story of a rare, uh, rarest of the rare friend. So for Harishchandra, that story which evoked his Indian ethos, which mattered. That is why he changes the names of the play very freely. Venice became Manshpur, Portia becomes Purashri, Shylock becomes Shailaksh, and so on. So there are uh, such such problems are there, and you see, but Harishchandra also understood that the conflict in the story of, or the 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 the, the central problem in the story is the story of the Jew. There's a problem with the, the Jew Shylock. This theme is at the very heart of the play. The heart of the play is not the Jew himself, but the Christian prejudice against the Jews, which Shakespeare deconstructs and interrogates in the play. That is the, uh, the, 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 the theme of the play. But how can you put this in the Indian context when there are no Jews? So in the Hindi speaking India, there was hardly any Jew. Jews were not part of the North Indian cultural currency at all. So what Bharatendra does is by making the Christians into Hindus and he replaces the Jews with the Jains. The representations of Jains in the South India is of course very different. But in the North India, uh, it is it's a very minuscule community and which is subsumed within Hinduism. There are two things, however, which distinguish them. One, they are very sattvic. They believe in sacrifice and austerity. And uh, more, they believe in these things in much more way than the, the other Hindus do. And second, they are very non-violent. These are, of course, very good qualities. And because of these, they are also very rich. So this is perhaps what Bharatendu had in mind when he put these together. But the antagonism that plays out in Shakespeare between the Christians and the Jews does not replicate in the cultural terms when Hindus meet giants in the North Indian context. But we find in Tamil, Pamal Sambandha Mudalya translated the same play into Tamil language. There also, he makes Shylock into a Jain money lender in the Hindu Shaiva Tamil society of Vanipuri. And it's Tamil in his Tamil translation of the play. But there, the context becomes a bit more prominent, where the 
Jain Tamil merchants or the Shettis are are uh, more prominent in in, in in Tamil community. The hostility between the Jains and the Satwaite Hindus is largely forgotten, but is make more sense in in, in the when when it like what it connotes in the in uh, Shakespeare's text. Another translation from the time, uh, which could be comedy of errors by another Hindi writer called Ratan Chand. Ratan Chand is a minor character, unlike you know Harishchandra. He translated the, the comedy of errors in 1882 with the title Brahma Janak. But this translation is very interesting because of one particular reference. And that reference is a very subversive reference. In the play, there's a minor scene where uh, we have two people, Romeo of uh, Syracuse, talks with the about a uh, woman character called Nell. And he says that she is so ample and plump that she is spherical in shape. She is like a globe on whose body different countries can be located. This is a very comical speech, of course. So the character to him, to whom uh, Romeo is addressing, asks where in her body you can locate England and where in her body you can locate Netherlands. Netherlands is a country which Englishmen hate a lot. Netherlands, of course, literally means lower countries. And the, uh, the, the connotation is that it's something that we hate, we don't like. Romeo replies in the original Shakespeare, Netherlands was somewhere in the lower parts of her body. I did not look where I did not look. Now in Hindi, Ratanjan turns it around. In the comedy of errors, does not mention India at all in, the, in Shakespeare. Although it mentions Indies. Uh, during Shakespeare's time, West Indies and East Indies, as we know, were thought to be one. Or more, for most of the Englishmen, they were one and the same thing. So, when he describes the ugly features of the kitchen, kitchen maid, kitchen maid's anatomy, in geographical terms, the Dromeo of Syracuse mentions Indies as it is on her nose, in the shape of pimples and carbuncles. But Shakespeare's, this is only direct, but this is maybe a reference to America. But on the other hand, Ratanjans asks the question, where is India? In Ratanjans Hindi translation, he asks the question, where is India? This question does not appear in Shakespeare at all. So Romeo answers this as if uh, answers that it was in on her, it was her face, the most important part of the body, making India the best of all countries. And then he makes the character ask the question, where is England? And now Romeo says, England is such a tiny country. It looked, I looked to find all around, but couldn't find it. Maybe it is somewhere there in her lower parts where I did not care to look. Remember, this is translation as subversion. It's a happy political subversion at the height of British rule in India. At the peak of the Raj in 1882, a Hindi writer sitting in a small town in Madhura pokes fun at British through the greatest English playwright itself. But it is not like that always. There are also questions of subservience in many other play and uh, other another other minor playwrights. Or the the, the um, example is uh, Lala Sidharam, for example, who translated many plays of Shakespeare into Hindi, 16. Uh, uh, Lala Sidharam's uh, translation of, um, uh, he translated many plays of Shakespeare into uh, Hindi. But then there he also advises the people. Look at, there are also subservience to English during that time. He was a member of the British administration, not the ICS kind of rank but just below that. But he says, he advises people to be subservient to English and to learn from the best of English cultures. 
in every of his translation, all his translations, this piece of advice was there as the preface to his translation in English. Of course, he was addressing this more to his masters than to his countrymen, because the translation was supposed to be in Hindi, which is to be read by Hindi people. There, the translation, this was not there, but in English, this was there, so that he was catering or pampering to the British people, British uh, superiors of this. In contrast of this, after 1950s, we find another Hindi translator, uh, Harivan Shrai Bachchan. He's the father of uh, Amidab Bachchan. Harivan Shrai Bachchan was uh, a professor of English in Allahabad University, and he was a member of uh, Nehru's administration. And after that, he went to Cambridge, where he got a PhD in WB Yeats, and he comes back. So I would like to say that he was a well-known poet, very known poet in English. Madhushala is one of his famous works in, in Hindi literature, even one of the classics in Hindi literature. So he was a poet who knew his English and knew English very well, and he took his PhD on one of the best English poets, W. B. H. and then he translates Shakespeare. But how does he translate Shakespeare? That's very interesting. For example, he translates with a certain kind of authority. Uh, in Hamlet, for example, this question comes, or this famous question, to be or not to be, that's the question. How will we translate it? Grammatically speaking, strictly speaking, to be what? Not to be what? This remains incomplete in Shakespeare. But that is the beauty of that expression. That's another matter. But to be or not to be, that is the question. Most of the people, most of the students in Shakespeare are confused to be what? So Harima Shrai Bachchan, the, the well-known English poet, a liter, a writer on his own merit, and a great scholar of English. Now he translates his Hamlet like this. Ab jina hai ya marna hai, tai karna hai. I have now to decide whether I should live on or whether I should die. That makes it meaning very clear. But the way in which uh, Bachchan translates it leaves no room for anyone to say that this has gone down from Shakespeare. Another, this is what we call explicitation. In, this is one of the translation strategies that we use. Another example comes from Macbeth. For example, uh, look at this, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, look at this expression. Letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage. I would do this, but I dare not do this, is like the cat in the proverb. But what in, did the cat in the proverb do? Nobody knows. Many English teachers keep on teaching this to students, and they do not know what the cat in the proverb do. They just would say, like the cat in the proverb. But Bachchan translates it beautifully. He says, Billy Machali Kayagi par pavna bhigi. The cat wants to eat fish, but it does not want its feet to get wet. This puts the meaning very clear. Again, he uses cultural adaptation when he translates Othello, again, very beautifully. There was a particular scene uh, as well in the beginning of the play where Othello has just eloped and the news is to be broken to Desdemona's father, Brabantio. And uh, Iago wants to put it in the most crudest possible manner, inciting and provoking the father into some kind of an action. The phrase used by Shakespeare is even now, now, very now, you're an old black ram is tapping your white you. Arise, arise. Once again, even now, now, very now, an old black ram is tapping your white you. Arise, arise. Tapping, of course, means having sex or fornicating. The white you is a little female lamb, and the old black ram is said to be fornicating with, that is, Othello is having sex with Desdemona against the will of the father. 
The phraseology is provocative and by intent is to provoke the father into action and stop other law if possible. In Bachan's translation, he uses ram, you, these are strange words in India. For, in, for an Indian, ram, uh, uh, sheep, does not connote anything. It is an animal to be slaughtered, that's all. But for India, Indians, Hindus, cow and calf is something that evokes some kind of cultural meaning in it. So Bachan puts like this, Abhi is gadi, kahi tumari ujli bachiyas si kanya par kala mota sal chada hai. The big fat bull is now riding your white, little, innocent, tender she calf. Now this suddenly, you know, provokes or, 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 or motivates an Indian mind or signifies more for an Indian rather than uh, 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 a distant evocation of, um, of, of, a, of, of, a, uh, of sheep. So like this, we find uh, these translations of Shakespeare localizing the expressions. Uh, how, was it effective? Uh, there may be questions. See, but in, in the year 1880, there was a certain version of symbolism being played in Baroda in a wedding festival by a troupe called, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the name of the play was Tara and not Symbolin. It's a royal wedding in Baroda. And this was played in typical Sanskrit format with the Sutradhar, Nandi, gods, and sages on stage. So the many translations for stage were followed, uh, you know, as we know, the Sanskrit conventions of the stage or the Indian stage conventions. So many people were afraid that this was not good. But Harold Little Dane, an Englishman, uh, C.J. Sisson reports that this version was so good that it outdid the original in effect. So Indians were masters in manipulating these stories from Shakespeare into their culture and they produced wonderful plays. See, one of the best Shakespeare portrayals of the comedy of errors in any language, one of the best translations in any language that has, been, that has come out as a film now, it is, by, it is called Angu by uh, Gulzar. It's in the 1980s that the play was produced. If anybody has not watched it, please go and watch it, Angu. Uh, it is a, simply the best adaptation of this, this play. The first adaptation, the movie, the, or the talkie version of Hamlet comes from India. That is in the 1930s. Till then, Hamlet as a talkie did not come. Okay, so I think I'm uh, reaching the end of my time. So we have uh, uh, other concerns also. But remember, when this translation came for uh, Angkor, it was not just a first hand translation. Rather, this was this play came up first in Bengali, and then it came to as a film in Bengali, then it was made into Hindi as a film, and then finally this Hindi film came up Angur. And today, no, we as we we speak most you know, in, about, about the Macbeth translations in glowing terms. The Akira Kurosawa was Macbeth. People, the Western people, or most of the Shakespeare studies, uh, or Shakespeare studies in films speak about Macbeth, uh, Akira Kurosawa was a uh, film version of Macbeth. But in the recent uh, Cambridge uh, uh, studies on Indian literature, or Shakespeare, or Shakespeare in, in the world, Shakespeare translations, the chapter on Kurosawa is uh, replaced by a chapter 
on Vishal Bharadwaj, who made, as they say, a better translation of Macbeth as Makbul in Hindi. So India has got many good uh, versions of Shakespeare. Only thing is that many people do not know the extent to which Shakespeare is translated and influencing us. Many of our expressions come from Shakespeare. And they have gone to great lengths. Our translators have gone to great lengths in uh, translating Shakespeare origin in, in, in the original way or, or, or in, the, in the faithful manner and some people in the most uh, the adaptive manner. I will uh, stop here with giving you one more example. In the 1890s, two versions of Shakespeare were played in Bengali. One was a version of the same play, Hamlet. Uh, sorry, one, one was Macbeth. That play was produced by the teacher, the master. His translation was, the translation was faithful. The production was up to the English standard. And they even brought the Scottish group in the Scottish dress and the original Scots to come and uh, rehearse with the company and they produced a very expensive production in the 1790s, but that failed miserably on the stage. But his disciple, Amarendra Dutta, he produced Hamlet, which is said to be a more difficult play. He produced Hamlet, but he translated the play up to an Indian context. And that play ran for almost 10 years on the British stage, uh, on the English, Bengali stage. One of the most successful productions of uh, Shakespeare in India. The recent productions, like, um, or not the recent, uh, but the two, 2000, early two, the 1990s productions of uh, The Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, uh, using the Chhattisgarhi motif by Habib Tanbir was one of the great productions, typical Indian productions of Shakespeare. Now you see in, in the films, many Indian productions, Indian variations of Shakespeare. Some of them, you don't even realize that it is Shakespeare, but only after that you understand when they write that it is a play based on Shakespeare's play, they understand, okay, the plot was exactly the same, the lines were exactly the same. So Indian translation of Shakespeare has come a very long way. And uh, I'm, uh, for the information of some of you, for the students, you know, I'm uh, offering a course on Shakespeare across cultures for the UGC in the uh, MOOC courses, where you know, the detailed versions of the discussion that I had is being done. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Anjana. Sir, yes, thank Dr. you very Dr. much for your harmonious and come newfangled presentation. Uh, so the participants merrily pointed out that uh, it was a wonderful presentation, scholarly deliberation, and much enlightening one, things like that. So thank it's you. my great pleasure to share this with you, sir. So now I request you to clarify participants' queries. Yes, very glad. I'll call out the question, sir. Yes. Sir, yes. this question is from Sharma. Yes. How good and valid is the division of changing the 
locals and races in translated versions. Isn't it only recreation or rewriting? What is your take on the film adaptations of Shakespeare? I saw that question. How valid is the diversion of changing the locals, uh, locales and the races in uh, translated versions? Now, uh, Shakespeare was a professional playwright who was communicating to his people in London. Uh, let's take the play, for example, Hamlet. Hamlet was from Denmark, or the Roman plays, which are played out either in Arabia or in Rome. But they were presenting, Shakespeare presented them in typical English dress. And his, all his actors were typical English men. His Caliban was played by an English man. So the question, how valid is the diversion, is also applicable to Shakespeare. Shakespeare also has changed. If you look at Shakespeare's plays, most of the plays, you know, for, for the students, for most of these Shakespeare's plays, almost all of, except two or three of Shakespeare's plays, have got solid sources. There are good studies on that. All these plays, for example, Hamlet comes from another play just before that called Hamlet or Hamlet. And, uh, you know, the Othello comes from uh, account earlier. How can we? Or Cynthia's tale. So, Shakespeare is trying to adapt the foreign plays into his context, and he used only Englishmen to act in his plays because he was talking to his countrymen. Now, how can I present a play which is not connected to me? Then it will come to me like a fairy tale. It doesn't mean to me. If you look at the play Makbul, where uh, it's a it's about you know gang uh, wars or the Bombay underworld. Anybody who lives in Bombay or understands the culture of Bombay will easily understand what that play means. It actually means to it, it actually uh, makes sense uh, to, the, to the to the to the to the audience. And uh, uh, there, there is another play of uh, Macbeth, uh, which. Um, I uh, forgot the name of the play. Uh, a, a, a South African play, liked by Mandela. Mandela actually you know, was a voracious reader of Shakespeare. When he was in the prison, he actually signed one of the copies of Shakespeare with, which a, a, a friend had, and that is now being celebrated in South Africa. He heard about a particular play of Macbeth, a local version of Macbeth, using African drama, African music, African theme, and African myths. And then he was highly influenced by that. And he wanted the writer of the play to revive the play. Unfortunately, Mandela did not live to see the revival of the play. But after Mandela's death, they revived the play. And if you see, uh, the, I mean, uh, the, the last play that I was speaking about, the, uh, Tara, I mean, um, the Hamlet play, again, I forgot the name of the play, uh, in Bengali, we find that uh, the success, the reason for the success of the play was that it was transformed and produced in the local audience. Now, your question is valid. About translation, what does it mean? The Western idea of translation, as we understand it today, is what prompts you to ask this particular question. That's a valid one also, because there you go line by line, word by word, because we need from one end to the other, you need a computerized translation because you need a corpus. But at the end of it, what is that we are communicating? We are communicating literature. In communicating literature, do you put across the bhava, the rasa across? That is all about literature. If we can communicate what Macbeth actually meant, that makes sense. 
Uh, so, my take on the film adaptations of Shakespeare, well, these are independent creations. Like, you know, when I translated uh, a play, I'm sorry, a, a novel is called Adu uh, in Malayalam, and it is translated in English. Penguin published it uh, with the title God Days. Uh, that translation, the author says, Benjamin, the author says, well, the translation is the translator's product. My product is the original. I can write only in Malayalam, and this author, this translator produces it in English. Grigory uh, Barasa, for example, who translated uh, uh, Marquis from Spanish into English. Spanish, uh, no, Marquis was willing to wait for to get uh, Rabaza's dates, to get his work translated. He did not want to give to anybody else. And Marquez said, Rabaza's translations are actually better than my Spanish original. Remember, we are speaking about Marquez. So translation is a difficult question. What do we understand by translation? Because you know, the denotative and connotative meanings of the word translation. In the extended meaning, it comes to adaptations, recreations, uh, retakes on that. And it becomes a springboard. And this is exactly what happened in Shakespeare's stage. The, this, the, the actors were given cues and the actors were speaking mostly on their own in a stage. Any professional actor will know that. They may not exactly conform to the lines given by the, 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 the playwright. They might, and they go with the mood. And that's why makes what makes the play different. I think. I answered your question, Sharmaji. It may not be it may not be to your satisfaction, but then that's the only answer that we can give. So thank you, sir. The next question is from Nilanjan. How important is it for the translator to remain faithful to the text, to live and breathe in the source language so that the target language can capture the precise spirit of the source language? If the translator is not able to capture the exact spirit of the source language, then what is the point of translation at all? It's a very good question. That's a question that permanently uh, plagues the translators. One, you cannot translate a work from one language to another unless you have the mastery of the source language. You have to be good at source language. If you read the source language well, if you study, I mean, if you use the source language well, then you can understand the spirit of the source language text. Then you have to be good at this target language also to communicate that spirit into the target language. So of course, you have to have the linguistic, communicative, strategic competences and discourse competences in uh, the target and the source languages. Certainly you have to have that, but then, no language communicates exactly the same thing. That's one of the problems that we find. I, that's why the example that I gave you, the simple word God, how can you translate it? You can translate it only as God. At the moment I say Bhagwan, Ya Allah, or Ishwar, the meaning changes because theologically, historically, culturally, Contextually, the meaning is different. So what can we do? We have to come to the nearest approximation. What do we get to the nearest makes sense. But then this is a classic Indian question. How meaning is created? Is, do you create meaning when a word is uttered or when a sentence is completed? This is a classic Buddhist question. Or even it is, I think it's also in the in Nyaya system, also it's there. The when, when do you get the meaning of a word complete? Or, or of a sentence, my utterance complete? Is it when I speak on or when I complete my sentence and put a full stop to that? So when is a full stop of a literary text? Literary text gets a full stop when the whole play is finished, all the work is finished. 
till then every unit in that of only contributes to the meaning of the the complete text the complete meaning the complete signification of that particular literary uh, expression so this is a valid question but then the moment you translate and take it across the stream this is the only option available you don't have a better option that's why in spanish they call the word for translator is a similar to the one like cheater or a traitor not a cheater traitor uh, it's applicable for both without translation you will not understand it but with translation the meaning has to be different there is no one to one correspondence in language in language meaning is created with the context and with there's a whole philosophy of your life your culture your history everything is behind it only then even in tamil and for example in tamil i'm sure most of the students sitting here in tamil uh, in tamil for example uh, kedaku means very you know malayalis don't understand the meaning of kedaku kedaku uh, the sun rises in the east malayalis don't understand the meaning of the word kedaku i don't know if tamilians do understand the reason is for us the sun rises in the hills and sets in the arabian sea for tamilians sun rises in the in the in the sea in the east and sets in the western ghats kedaku the sun rise comes from kirku kir from below the sun comes up but for us malayalis the sun comes from the hills milk but still we use the word kirk and for you the sun sets in the hills padi 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 nyayar nyayar is sun padi nyayar padi nyayar that is the word in malayalam for us the sun goes down for you the sun rests on the hills for us it goes down in the sea So these are different evocations the more you love language the more you love words words will tell you more but then that import of those words cannot be translated into other languages we can only find nearest approximation but to do that to be a good translator you have to be good at the source language as well as the trans the target languages and you have to be a scholar in both otherwise you will be a cheater yes so thank you sir so most of the participants request that uh, they are asking you to throw your light on research ideas for translation there are so many so many research ideas on translation any text can be approached you know uh, translation is one of the most important uh, topics that we i mean most of my students i'm i'm asking most of my students in their research to work on translations i'm actually specializing on shakespeare translation um whether translation is an adaptation one of the problems that we have to look at you know how translation is being looked at now translation is good provided a literary corpus can be built up i am sure in tamil there is a big exercise being done in a, you are building a tamil corpus so one to one correspondence that is the modern need a technology mediated kind of uh, translation requires the one to one correspondence so we try to build up that kind of a corpus of of languages for that the literal meaning literal translation is to be encouraged but for literary translations these literary meanings will not help so how closely you can bring these together depends on how good you create the uh, the, the corpus that's a big project if some teacher can take it up i think that will be a very good project in sahitya uh, academy to be and and uh, the uh, um, center for indian languages uh, should be together should be taking up this project of uh, uh, of literary translations but in order to do a literary translation we have to, we need to build up the corpus and that doesn't happen one day it's a long project it will take a long time 
and needs the effort of hundreds of people. So that is a different story altogether. Is one individual scholar can contribute really a bit to that. Another individual scholar can do a bit to that. But together, we will be building a big dictionary. That's why most of the Indian languages don't have proper dictionary. On the other hand, if you look at the English language, their dictionaries are now products of their corpus, which they have developed. I was teaching corpus linguistics in the 1990s. I was teaching that, sorry, in 2002, I was teaching corpus linguistics. From then, I became interested in this idea. And then I was wondering, you know, why that, why is that we don't have a translation corpus? Basically, because we are producing dictionaries after dictionaries without the corpus being built. You have to tag the words. I'm sure a good exercise, Tamil is by far the best language in India where corpus is being built. But then still, our effort is not sufficient. We have to put all the regional varieties together with all, with all the Indian languages. We need to build these literary corpus and not just connotative meanings. The literary text won't get translated. There's one part. The other part is that you can use the modern theories of translation. The translation of the Bible is a good example. How translation comparative analysis of translation can be done. If you go to the source, the biblical, and the online sources are available. If you go to type uh, the source text, you will find the original text of the in the Hebrew or in Latin or in Greek. The texts are available. What is every word is numbered. Every single word is numbered. And the meaning of that word in different contexts is given. For example, in the book of Genesis, this word is up like this, logos, for example. The word logos means this in the book of Genesis. In the book of John, it is different. In the Psalms, it is different. So they will bring all these words together. So that will be a good model for us. So we need to look at, revise our classical text, classical Indian language text, and put them together and build up this corpus. This is a slow exercise. What the Englishmen are enjoying today is because of their effort, systematic effort for a long time. They did not build, build the corpus one fine day. But today we have the advantage of technology. We may be able to use that. So the other approaches to translation are also there, theories of translation. So you can use that. But I would recommend my students, the, all the students here, to take the local language text, the language in which you are more familiar with. First, study your own language. That's important. When you want to study, uh, get a PhD in English, uh, in translation studies, first you have to understand your own language. Study the language very well. Get that um, mastery, have a command over your language. Understand the meanings of the words in your language. Most of the, our people do not know what, the, what is the meaning of the words in language because we take it for granted <laughs> that we know the meaning. Believe me, when you look strong, closely at the meaning or discuss with tam some Tamil scholars, they will tell you what's the meaning of the word. They will now you will understand, okay, there are other ways to look at language. So the theories of language is one option. Then you can look at the subjectivity of the translator and the translated. And basically, I would advise you to look for local language texts and attempt a translation on your own. That's the best way to study a translation. Or I, I ask all my students who want to study translation and do a PhD with me. I want, I have, one thing that I'm asking you to, them is to translate the text first. All my PhD students who do a PhD on Shakespeare with me, I'm asking them to do a translation of Shakespeare into the local language, whatever is their language. That will put them in close touch with the text itself. That will engage them with the practical problems of translation. OK. Thank you, sir. This is the last question. So this is the last question, yes. sir. Yes. How far would you look upon translations of Basha literatures into English as a transfigured way of perpetuating a new colonial mindset? What is it? Which way? I didn't get your question. 
sir how transfigured how way of perpetuating yeah. okay uh, uh dr uh, uh, gn devi's uh, books uh, on uh, i mean he, he, he is some somebody who is working on bhasha literature the bhasha actually means uh, the the deshi the deshi the uh, not not the mainstream languages but the 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 marginalized languages that's the technical sense of bhasha literature not the marki kind of literature but the bhasha or the deshi kind of literature uh, uh how far would i look up on the translations of the such literature into english is a transfigured we are perpetuating a neo colonial mindset why should we think that you know our translation is in, i mean uh, will help them in a neo colonial mindset rather we are articulating precisely against that if they want to understand our text well one meaning one way is that you know you come and read our language and you understand our language that's one thing that you can say you if you want to understand my language you come and read my you come and learn my language and do it but now it is it not better for our language to reach more people our literature to reach more people through translations translation does not necessarily mean translations into english many people often think that translations to english is the translation that is a colonial mindset how many of the tamil texts are translated into malayalam how many of the malayalam texts are translated into tamil how many of tamil texts are translated into bengali odia punjabi urdu that's also translation so it is not a neo colonial mindset but the other kind of question where i can interpret your question is that if when i translate my text i am trying to control the that particular language the target language people target language culture that's also not right because i am only exporting my text once the text is translated and gone out of my hand it's up to the reader to understand it the translator is not the author who is dead even the translator is dead the moment he has finished translation so let the reader find out the meaning of the text we cannot dictate once the text has gone out of our hand it is gone out of our hand will it influence those people well it depends on the people who read it if it is worth reading they will certainly make meaning out of it otherwise they will not make meaning out of it why do ramayana influence us because that's a text worth reading why is quran influencing us because that's a text worth reading why gita influences us why tirukural influences us the same as a case but there are millions of other books which are not at all considered by people those texts won't influence us the books worth getting influenced by will influence us either this way or that way is it not better to read the text in the original yes certainly as you know saint jerome who translated the bible said a translation should lead you to the original and not the other way so he proposes a theory of translation i mean it is actually he begins and later uh, schleimacher and uh, later you know uh, i think it is venuti who speaks about the foreignization and localization of translation the how much of text should be foreignized should the translator's approach is to take the text to the reader or the take the reader to the text that's our approach that we have to understand saint jerome who translated the bible said anyone who reads the translation should go and read the original so rather i should encourage the trans the reader to read the original of the translation man should be not so communicative a kind of translation he should make them read because the text is being worth being read in the original so you go have to make prompt you to take you back to the original text yes thank you thank very you much for, for your for the question yes yeah. sir thank you very much for your remarkable you. and outstanding presentation sir thank you very much thank i enjoyed you. being here and i sorry that i could not participate in the conference for a longer time okay, because sir. we had a nac meeting in our university that's one of the i am the head of the department also so i am bit caught up with that otherwise i would have loved to continue with your with you and your whole program 
thank you for inviting me and thank you for, for patiently listening i appreciate all the good gesture thank you very much yeah so thank you once again sir dear participants kindly be ready for the next technical session sorry for the next session indeed it's my great pleasure to outline dr m ilangovan's educational self efficacy he has presented and published nearly 40 research papers in various reputed organizations and journals he also published six books he has held many academic and administrative positions in various well respected institutions so the zoom platform is for you thank you ma'am thank you sir respected principal of srnm college dr b ajanta the one of the organizers of this e conference on translation professor fresh nirmal another organizer of this e conference on translation and my dear participants of this conference a very warm good afternoon to all of you it's really a great pleasure for me to once again visit the department of english srnm college on this virtual platform since i have been to that department many a times it means that dr ilangovan i under the department of english srnm college both of them have some umbilical connection it shows that kind of uh, fondness that uh, the department of english srnm college has for me so i hope that uh, the participants might have been exposed to various uh, aspects of translation for the last uh, two days of course we are heading towards the uh, uh, pre lunch session so by this time we might have uh, listened to various uh, concepts related to translations so the reason that three for my being here is that as uh, dr b ajanta has uh, rightly pointed out is that uh, one of my six books is a translation of uh, a great classical work in tamil for the sake of other participants i would like to say about uh, the translation of uh, mine on the didactic poetry of avayar avayar is a, a classical poet in tamil and i have translated for of her works into english for the clear understanding of the non native speakers of tamil language especially the translation aims at the younger generation of this time so why do i say this is not to boast of myself but to give you some idea that i have some practice if not a, a complete and a perfect one some practice in uh, translation translating uh, literary texts into other languages i have translated from in poems of english origin into tamil or tamil lang poet poems into english so with this background i think i can uh, sakan the title translation a polyphonic problem so the very title indicates 
that uh, there are some problems in translation. Of course, problems are the right things for our growth, both in our life and also in our, all our literary endeavors. So in that sense, I positively look at the word problem. So the objective here in that title is polyphonic problem. So I will go into this aspect of my title before, after giving my views on the conventional ways of looking at translation, the traditional perspectives on translation. The conventional views on translation says that it is a, a kind of communication from one language into another language. It's a kind of message from one language into another language. We have uh, the comfortable zone that uh, there is a triad in all kinds of uh, translations. The triad is that uh, there is a message to be sent. Here, I mean the literary text. There is a message to be sent. And then there is a sender to send this message. And at the other end, we have a receiver who will receive this message. So this is uh, the conventional view of, on translation. The sender is there, the message is there, the receiver is there. Together, these three points connect themselves to give a clear-cut connection among themselves. And the trade also says that there are some explicit influences of one of these points on the other points. For example, the sender can have an influence on the message. The message can have the influence on the receiver. The receiver can have an influence on the sender. So in that way, they are interconnected. That is why I called these three things as a, a triad. They make a triad. That's why I again say that there are some explicit influences, that, okay, visible influences. And another thing is that there is a linear arrangement between or among these three things. You can put the message in the middle of this triad and on the left side, you can have the sender and on the right side, you can have the receiver. So this is the comfortable zone of any translation we think. Okay, there are many names in the conventional views for this uh, trial. We have uh, addresser, addressee, the message. We have the encoder, the en decoder, and the message or the sign. Or we have the triad, the speaker, the spoken voice, uh, word and the message, the receiver. And this is how the conventional uh, views on uh, translation uh, go on. But for me, as a practicing translator, what I feel uh, personally is that uh, any translation is a, a linguistic crisis. It uh, definitely makes 
a kind of uh, continuous uh, ripple or ripples in both the languages. That is why I call any translation is a, a linguistic crisis. It's the crisis of a language. It is in the act of translation, the language either cries or loves it, the people. So completely language centered activity. It's a kind of linguistic engagement, linguistic activism. But we have to go out of these uh, are these conventional uh, views or perspectives on uh, translation. So for that, we have to go for uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, so views on uh, language. And why I have uh, chosen uh, the title as translation as a, a polyphonic problem. The very word polyphone gives us the idea that there are many voices. Okay. Now, the word takes all of us to another area of art that's it music so the word polyphonic as an adjective is used in the world of music so polyphonic is a, a musical metaphor we can take that musical metaphor far over it discussion. When I say that uh, translation is uh, polyphonic in nature, what do I mean by that uh, polyphonic construction is that uh, there are some inherent uh, dialogism, which means that uh, the very attempt of translation is a, a kind of dialogue. So the very attempt of translation, two languages meet and talk between themselves. They are like, uh, sometimes they are like uh, friends, sometimes they are like uh, enemies, but uh, in either case, uh, they speak to each other. So this is the internal ability of uh, looking at uh, the act of translation that uh, the text uh, speaks to the other language. The language of one text uh, is uh, speaking to the language of uh, the other text. So it is not uh, people who talk among themselves. It is not uh, literary texts uh, who share their meanings to other literary texts, but it is uh, the language which speaks to the other language. That is why I have given this title. So when you say that uh, there is some kind of a polyphonic nature in translation, what is actually meant in the act of translation is that uh, language our languages have some kind of uh, dialogue between themselves. There may be a friendly dialogue or there may be sometimes there may be a clash between uh, these two languages. So conventionally we have these uh, names for these two languages, uh, target language and uh, source language and target language. So in that way, we can say that uh, one language uh, tries to speak to another language with the help of language. 
and that language is uh, the act of translation. So what my idea here is to give you the impression that uh, translation is uh, a kind of, uh, that very act is uh, a kind of trans language. Of course, uh, uh, this is what I mean by the word uh, polyphonic problems. When I speak to somebody else, when one language tries to speak to the other language, it has to meet uh, certain problems. Okay. So this inherent dialogic nature of uh, a literary text uh, becomes uh, a kind of uh, problem for uh, the translator. So it is, uh, it, sometimes the uh, uh, act of translation goes uh, beyond the control of uh, the translator. He has to remind the language that, uh, please be quiet, please uh, remain silent. So the act of translator here becomes uh, the act of uh, a controller of uh, the source language or the target language. The role of the translator here becomes a, a kind of a moderator between two languages. Because uh, both the languages uh, try to speak uh, between themselves, uh, relegating the role of the translator. Relegating the role of the translator. The translator at, is at a crossroads because uh, he wonders uh, how effectively these two languages uh, speak between themselves uh, if he silently, you remember the word, if he silently looks at uh, the speaking languages of uh, these two languages. So this is really a very wonderful way of uh, allowing the languages uh, to speak between themselves to or to, to speak among themselves. So what, then what is the role of uh, the translator? When he allows uh, to, uh, the readers to listen to the poly polyphonic nature of uh, the languages, uh, he becomes uh, the organizer of an orchestra, the translator. That is, that is why I told you that uh, polyphonic is uh, a musical metaphor. So here, the translator becomes uh, the organizer of an orchestra. He allows the languages to come out with a, a kind of chorus. This chorus is very important because uh, it is uh, really a very subtle act. So the subtlety of translation uh, allows us to listen to the nuances of these two languages uh, when they engage themselves in uh, the speaking activity. This engagement is very, very powerful one. Very, very relevant one. And this engagement is uh, taking place uh, again and again for a long time, continuously in the world of translations. Allow the text to speak among themselves. That should be the mantra or the motto of our uh, literary translating endeavor. So this internal dialogic nature of uh, translation gives us an explicit narrative consideration. Now, the next question is, how does a language speak to the other language? How does, I, I put it in a very simple way for the sake of the students who may be participating in this e-conference and also for my simple question is that, 
how does one language speak to the other language in translation so for this question i have to go back to the ideas of lacan where he talks about juvisans j o u i s s a n s juvisans where he talks about the unconscious nature of language and he refers language in our unconscious in, in that way the unconscious is structured like a language which means that our unconscious is our language and our language is our unconscious so the traditional idea of language is that it works because of too many signifiers and all these signifiers have their own links and because of the existence of these various links we have the possibility of one language speaking to the other language or we have the possibility of signifiers speaking with the signifiers of other language other in the same language so in that way we have the traditional view on language but there is another word lalang by lakan which means that language functions without any links it goes beyond our perspective when lakan says that language lalang the concept of lalang and translation tries to bring in that idea of lalang into its ambit it means that translations become a kind of mode without any confinements and in that sense we can understand the concept of bhakti now the word polyphonic pra takes me to other areas where there are multiple choices for the translator any translation takes me to a world where there are many worlds and we have a chance to see this pluralistic world with the help of translation and this pluralistic world has a continuous or continual dialogue among themselves and charles bally talks about this continual dialogue among languages when translation takes place so throughout this session i try to give you the idea that translation is a kind of speech so that is my idea that we should have or carry when i finish this session the very act of translation is a kind of creating a new language it is a, a speaking language so in this pluralistic uh, continual act of translation what do we have is uh, a common platform that the language becomes uh, a shared property which means that uh, no one can claim that uh, it is uh, my language here we have to throw away the conventional idea of uh, 
target language or source language because no one owns the language this is what i mean to say i try to say when we have to think about uh, translation of course we have the common idea that this is my native language and all these things but beyond this we have to go over to that idea that language becomes a shared property it means that translation becomes a trans a shared property another idea which comes after this is the when i say that translation is a shared property it has another meaning in it which means that my translation belongs to blanks within quotes my translation belongs to other people which means that my language belongs to other languages even though these other people don't speak my language my language belongs to them this is what the idea of translation arises or this is how the idea of translation arises that is why i told you that nobody can speak about the concept of native language or target language or source language or whatever no longer these words are in the same sense after the charles bally's ideas on the continual dialogues of languages in the world of translation okay now another problem arises when i say that translation is an act of speech another question arises in our mind is that can this act of speech be silenced this is the biggest question that arises in our minds when we say that every act of translation is a speech can this act of translation if it is considered to be a speech be silenced because we always have the tendency to silence the speech we have the traditional notion even when our children speak in the classrooms as teachers we have the tendency to silence them now are we in that position to silence languages can we make languages remain silent because i have already told you that when translation takes place languages speak between themselves or among themselves no this is my answer to that question language the act of translation can never be silent the act of speech can never be silenced the speaking activity speaking within quotes that is the translate because uh, as i said earlier languages uh, speak among themselves we can never stop uh, languages uh, interact uh, between themselves or among themselves they continuously will speak among themselves nobody has uh, the right to silence them the very purpose of uh, establishing sagatya academy is to make this act of languages talking to themselves that is the very purpose all bashal languages they talk among themselves in the journal of indian literature published by sagatya academy of course in one language in english indian literature journal the journal titled indian literature which means that continuously the interaction among these languages take place they move on they go on they, nobody can stop this so another thing that i can talk about is that when i say that languages 
belong to other people even though the other people don't speak my language they, my language belongs to other that is the idea that i should uh, have which means that uh, that is why i told you that uh, languages are uh, shared properties languages are uh, shared properties now another question arises when we continue our journey on this area is that we have two types of activities in the act of translation if my ideas are there in my language alone if i allow my ideas to remain in my language alone my thoughts become in one sense personal thoughts my duty as a translator is to liberate these thoughts into other languages that is what i do as a translator so there is always a kind of a technical giving and taking act going on between the personal thought and the liberated thought in the act of translation by liberated thought i mean the thought which has been translated into other languages but i don't mean that they are in prison in the mother tongue when they are in their mother tongue but which means that in one sense they become personal thoughts so this is how after bakhtin charles bally as a, a man who is able to identify the problems of translation in the world of a, a, a linguistic field bakhtin has talked about the dialogic nature but charles bally is able to give us the idea that we have to accept the fact no language is our language or in another sense our language is all other people's language this is how we have to look at the act of translation the owners the question of ownership question the question of ownership is now question do i own a language that is the next question that we have to do i own a language no when you look at the problem of a language from the field of translation we don't own a language but we share a language that is why i told you that our language and our thought should become a liberated thought so the act of translation leads us to the act of liberation okay so uh, this is how charles bally talks about uh, the belongingness of languages in the act of translation to whom do they belong all these languages and then comes uh, the third uh, personality aswald the crot d u c r o t it is he who uses the term polyphony he says that uh, when he uses the term polyphony in the world of translation what he means is that the speaker is not the owner of the speech that is the greatest idea in continuing with what charles bally has left behind himself as well dograt takes up the idea to the other level where the speaker does not own the speech which means that no language can 
say to the other languages that uh, no this is my thought but you cannot translate into other languages which means that uh, the question of ownership is uh, questioned as i said earlier which means that uh, the very word polyphony yes i will tell you so panmari uh the very word polyphony is able to depict the picture that the speaker is not responsible for the content so here the idea is that no literary text belongs to any one which means that even the author cannot claim that he has written this thing because the author here becomes only as an announcer for example like the man or the woman who is in charge of announcing the arrivals and departures of trains in the railway station here the author is only an announcer of the arrival of the literary text he remains only as an announcer i ask here comes my hamlet says shakespeare my hamlet comes at, at uh, 10 o'clock this is how uh, hamlet uh, shakespeare can say my daffodils comes uh, only in the evening so this is uh, you have you noticed that uh, the ownership the problem of ownership is uh, continuing even in the, the way in which uh, the session is being moved which means that uh, now i am speaking to you about translation now i can say that uh, i am not responsible of course of course uh i'm not responsible for what i speak so this is the condition of uh, the translate now when i say that uh, the speaker is not responsible for the speech two questions arise naturally in our mind Two questions arise naturally in our mind. What is the role of the author? This is the first question. And then the second question is, what is the role of the speaker? Now, when we begin to talk about the roles of both the author and the speaker, of course. whatever it is a translator whatever it is the problem of interpretation also comes in the problem of interpretation also. so when you talk about the roles of the speaker or the role uh, role of the author what we have in our mind is that the problem of interpretation arises and we uh, we have already come to the conclusion that we don't own a language in that connection we can even say that there is no single utterance which means that there is no single language which means that no language is a single language they are interconnected in one way or the other because they always interact among themselves that is why i say that uh, translation is an act of uh, polyphonic problem the thing best thing for all of us to sit silently and close down our eyes uh, and open up our ears uh, and uh, listening to how the speech among these languages uh, go on that is the best way that uh, one can do by the act of translation we can uh, allow either ourselves or others 
to listen to the speeches of these languages talking to themselves as as friends talk among themselves or as enemies clash among themselves but uh, as tennyson said they are not innocent armies clashing at night they are powerful armies clashing at day time there is a do it there is a do it going on between these uh, two languages when uh, translation takes place it's a, really a melodious do it really a melodious do it uh, that we can hear as as we listen to the songs that is why i told you in the very beginning of, of my lecture that uh, the very word polyphonic uh, is connected here as uh, a musical metaphor now i have come to that point where i can very comfortably say that uh, translation is a do it between two languages translation is a do it between two languages. and another thing is that uh, the concept of do it can uh, take us to the another concept uh, or the other concept uh, where we can say that uh, a translation is uh, a choir of voices choir of white so all these are connected so the word phone is a very important signifier in this concept one language can be considered as a phone so this is how languages move are talked to among us are even i can say since i have talked about it, so uh, uh, so when i uh, give an extempore lecture it becomes very difficult for me to repeat what i say okay uh, so uh, this is how it, it it goes on okay do it under fire of uh, voices so let us all sing a translation this is what i can say let us all sing a translation not read a language not so the very attempt of translation is like singing a song okay so now the next thing that we should have is that after enjoying language is talking between themselves or among themselves we have to place ourselves in the place where we can see or look at the act of translation as we as if we were the philosophers of language the first part is over now looking at a the speaking ability of languages or the singing capacity of languages as music now it becomes uh, our bounden duty to create among ourselves uh, as uh, philosophers of language now when we place ourselves as uh, philosophers of language what happens to ourselves or what happens to language themselves that is the question that we have to ask when translation takes place is it a mere verbal communication no i have already proved that it is beyond verbal communication so when we place ourselves as a philosophers of language the single question or the simple question arises that uh, is it a mere verbal communication that takes place in the act of translation no no definitely not definitely not so we have uh, a junk of uh, various ideologies uh, related to 
the act of translation. We have sources of knowledge in translation. Because we have, since all these things arise, because we have placed ourselves as a philosophers of language in the act of translation. So we have come to the conclusion already that uh, uh, translation is not uh, a mere verbal communication or a transferring of uh, uh, one language from one language to another language. It has gone more than uh, beyond that level. And we have already seen that uh, the, it is a uh, do it, it is uh, that level. So we have uh, umpteen number of uh, sources of knowledge in translation. But the same translation gives us uh, sources of doubts regarding the reliability of uh, translation. Because uh, why do I say deliberately the word uh, doubt is that uh, we have the question of uh, translatability, but we have already seen that uh, languages can talk among themselves either as friends or as uh, enemies. I repeatedly say that uh, they can remain as friends, but uh, uh, at the same time, they can uh, fight among themselves or between themselves as enemies also, because it is in this context, I say that uh, they have uh, their own fights. So doubts arise. And we have our own beliefs and disbeliefs. So in the act of translation, we have two things. One is proposition and the other one is attitude. In the act of translation, we have two things. One is proposition and the other one is attitude. By proposition, I mean the spoken word. Now, when I look at uh, translation, I have already told you that we have to place ourselves as uh, the philosophers of language. When I become a philosopher of language, how do I look at uh, the, uh, the aspect of proposition? The proposition becomes uh, as an abstract entity when I look at uh, myself as uh, a philosopher of uh, translation or language, I'm sorry. Language here reminds as uh, an abstract entity. Now, when I bring in the word attitude, there is a connection between the abstract entity, language as an abstract entity with uh, a human factor because only a human being can have an attitude. That is, a language is brought down to another level where it can have the possibility of some kind of interaction with what? A human being. Now, in the act of translation, what happens is that of course, we need a, a translator. When that translator's presence is there in the act of translation, that translator deliberately, consciously creates the polyphonic nature of translation. So polyphony is a, a conscious attempt on the part of the translator. There are two factors in the polyphonic nature. One is the spatio-temporal factor, and the other one is a socio-cultural factor. By spatio-temporal factor, I mean space and time. The topographical element of uh, the target language and the source language and the target language. And the time of translation is also important. So I say that these are this is the first factor in the act of translation, spatio-temporal factor. 
and the second one is a socio cultural factor because now i have placed r i means here all of us because we are all interested in the act of translation we have to place ourselves in the place of the philosophers of language when we place ourselves as philosophers of language we have to look at the polyphonic act is a deliberate attempt on the part of the translator and with that bring come in the idea of the two factors so spatio temporal factor and the socio cultural act these are all interrelated things now when i say that the concept of polyphonic problem is further developed when i talk about the symphonic nature of translation there is always a clash there is always a clash between these two things by symphonic i don't mean that uh, there is a harmony already I, in the beginning of my lecture i told you that uh, translation is a linguistic crisis so only when there is a crisis uh, existence will become a meaningful one and in the world of translation polyphony is uh, the order of uh, the disorder this is really a uh, one so uh, symphonic nature is not desirable one so what do we need don't seek for equivalence because equivalence are myths in translation allow the words are the signifiers to fight among themselves you will get a kind of divisions that is the pressure of language okay so polyphonic nature can continue okay so in modern linguistic analysis of translation what do we now have is that we have to see this problem of polyphonic nature in the light of another one that is we have to have a pragmatic approach to language and we have already have in the traditional or conventional linguistics of translation we have semantic equivalences and syntactic equivalences these are uh, the conventional view and we all live in that uh, conventional view that uh, there are some uh, equivalences and uh, only when we have that kind of comfort uh, that uh, in other languages uh, equivalence exist uh, we begin to translate uh, but uh, as i have already pointed out uh, translation happens uh, only when we allow the language to have its own uh, linguistic crisis because uh, as a translator i would like to emphasize uh, this fact that uh, there is always uh, a difference uh, between saying things and knowing things i repeat the sentence as a man who believes in the polyphonic nature of translation i would like to give you the idea that uh, there is always a dif uh, difference uh, between saying things things which have the capacity to say something to reveal something to announce something to give something to the world and the world on the other side do we have the capacity to know things so there is always uh, the fight between uh, saying things and uh, knowing things so in this context uh, 
it becomes mandatory for all translators that they should have the subtle activity of interpretation or interrelations between saying things and knowing things between uh, saying things and so a translator's duty is to connect these uh, or to find out these uh, interrelations in one language and the other language so for any kind of polyphonic uh, interpretation we need uh, some linguistic marks that is language markers to scale the level of our translation to scale the level of our the knowledge of translation either in source language or in the target language this is uh, really very very important where do i keep my linguistic markers this is the biggest crisis for all of us where do i have my linguistic markers language markers or do i have them this is the question so to become sensible to these problems is the problem of a translator or is the problem of the people who read translations which means that i cannot make myself a comfortable one with only the knowledge of one language because the very word translation requires the knowledge of two languages this knowing one language is not a comfortable monophonic is a sin in translation being or remaining with one language is a sin that is why i told i repeat the word monophonic is a sin or being monophonic is a sin in language in translation knowing one language is a sin and it is not at all acceptable one in the world of polyphonic nature of translation so you can uh, uh, make uh, these uh, two concepts on the one side you have monophonic ideas and the other side you have uh, polyphonic ideas polyphonic ideas are uh, ideas uh, which can take you to uh, the other world uh, making you to listen to the choric nature of all languages they are really a powerful one of course they create certain problems but their these problems lead you to find out their own solutions in their own way so polyphonic nature is the nature of translations so as i said earlier as i said earlier don't go in for the exact meanings of the significance of one language with the signifiers of other language because as i said earlier equivalents are myths no equal no word comes very near to the exact meaning of the other word that is why i say that equivalents are myths and the last and final word for uh, from me is that uh, in translation polyphonic is uh, discourse oriented this is my last point polyphonic is uh, discourse oriented in translation in the world of translation polyphonic is discourse oriented what do i mean by discourse oriented is that it allows you to come out with uh, a dialogue again the very other uh, side discourses are there conversations are always there allowing all these languages speak simultaneously is uh, the duty and responsibility of uh, a translator or the people 
who are interested in translation we are all gathered here just because of the fact that uh, we are interested in translation this polyphonic uh, nature of translation is to be accepted in its own context because as i said earlier one crisis leads to another crisis uh, there is uh, as the in that way this linguistic crisis uh, continues uh, in, in a continual way for a long time for an everlasting time so only when the when we allow only when we allow the polyphonic discourse to continue we will have the melody of uh, the music of uh, translation now i compare uh, one uh, literary uh, world with the world of music so we have two pianos in our room in our mind in our uh, reading room one is one language and the other one is uh, the other language two pianos are there and our duty is to listen to the polyphonic music of uh, these two pianos by two, two pianos i mean two languages or other various languages of the world our duty is to transfer the music from one piano to uh, the other piano and listening silently to the songs of uh, crisis of translation so that is why or that is how the polyphonic nature of translation can go on can continue for a long time that is why i still emphasize the fact that uh, language uh, translation is uh, having this kind of uh, polyphonic discourse in it we should allow this uh, polyphonic di discourses to continue when i translated avaya so trans uh, uh, didactic poetry into english uh, i experienced this crisis in me and in my language uh, in my translation i was able to hear the music of uh, my language tamil and the inherent music of english also this is what uh, the duty of uh, the, the people who are interested in translation please allow ourselves to listen to the polyphonic nature of uh, languages because the discourse is always uh, musical in nature thank you so much for uh, the patient uh, listening to my lecture i hope uh, i uh, any doubts and other things thank you very much for your mind blowing and power packed presentation sir thank you participants are immensely happy listening to your versatile presentation sir please clarify this query received from dr ponmari velu velichami can you kindly share few of your polyphonic problems while you translated avvaya's poems let me repeat oh, yeah. can you kindly share few of your polyphonic problems while you translated avvaya's poems oh thank you so much uh, dr ponmari for asking this question so i will uh, i had too many polyphonic crises uh, when i translated avaya's uh, nalvali or mudurai or atichudi or kondravendar i will give you one example uh, from my translation of uh, avaya i as i said earlier i had too many problems but one example is uh, that uh, how can i translate the famous uh, saying in uh, avaya tayal sol kelel that was uh, 
biggest problem for me to translate into english because whether i uh, go by the ordinary meaning of uh, this word or should i go beyond that because the saying is that tayal sol kelir tayal and means uh, uh, in english it means a woman should i translate is the don't listen to the words of women or this was the biggest question in me when i translated that because it is in this sentence i heard the polyphonic nature of avaya avaya a woman or being a woman saying to the world that don't listen to the speech of women is it not illogical so there is a kind of contradiction in uh, avayar's uh, didactic line tayal sol kelir because uh, she herself is a woman saying to the world said uh, saying uh, to the world that uh, don't listen to the words of uh, should i translate uh, in that way that was uh, the polyphonic uh, crisis that i experienced and i had to add one more sentence or phrase to that translation one word so this is how finally i had to translate this tayal sol keli and it is a kind of transcreation for me because i wanted to have this kind of polyphonic nature in my translation don't heed to the meaningless words of women this is uh, how uh, uh, this is uh, how i had to translate it. of course uh, i cannot uh, uh, yes thank you so this is how i have to uh, i had to translate avaya tayal sol kelir into uh, english I, i i could not translate don't listen to the words of women no that is not the intention of avayar herself so i have to add one more phrase which is not explicitly that but which was yes this is the exact inference so i had to bring out the inherent meaning of that word so but the, i think that uh, dr panmari would have been satisfied with my explanation how i encountered encountered the problem of a polyphonic crisis so yes this is the next question okay ma'am from uh, mr s gopinath okay what exactly is the difference between translation and transcreation okay thank you gopinath when you translate something what happens is that as i said you don't allow the text to speak speak of what speak of the inherent musicology of the text a mere translation doesn't give you the exactness of its originality mere translation does not give the music of its originality but whereas as i get uh, given in my own translation of avayar i i cannot boast myself but for the sake of clarity i would like to say that the translation of tayal sul keli is a kind of transcreation he don't heed to the meaningless words of him which means that you can 
you should have the capacity to discriminate between the meaningful words and the meaningless words i added one more word that is a, an example of a transcreation a mere translation would have never satisfied the readers as had i translated that word as it is don't listen to the words of women i would have incurred the wrath of the entire women folk that's why i added another word by giving that inherent meaning the inherent contradiction of the text into that so this is what i mean by the difference between translation and transcreation i transcreated another world okay thank you for oh, sir, yes ma'am this is the last question okay, sir in translation on how to keep original meaning alive ah uh, yes very good question because uh, as i said earlier of course in the higher at, at a higher level at, uh, as i said in my session that uh, when we become uh, philosophers of language uh, we can claim that uh, there is no original meaning in language itself no language is original we all uh, of course uh, this is uh, a deconstructive meaning of uh, languages uh, are translations uh, saying that uh, because uh, we have that idea in our mind that uh, no language has uh, the originality in it so when you translate uh, don't be uh, don't bother about originality but bother about uh, the sincerity of translation that is will, that will be more important than how sincere you are in translator because uh, even in the original language there is no space for original we all think that uh, we communicate uh, very comfortably in our uh, mother tongue it is also a myth we don't communicate so in translation in the act of communication exactness is also a myth exactness is also a myth so there is no originality even in the original language so there is no question of uh, expecting that originality in uh, your target language but we can go very near to what the author or the writer has intended to express but that is why i told you in the session that there is no equivalent so equivalent means that we are always in search of equivalence equivalent is a mirage equivalent is a mirage we are we go after this mirage forever and this is not the right way yes there are differing uh, shanti ma'am there are many different ways of uh, looking at uh, translations so uh, what i would like to say to finally to the audience is that uh, we should uh, allow languages to speak uh, continuously creating this uh, linguistic crisis uh, so that uh, more number of translations can come out in the world uh, in future so you don't go in for exactness equivalents are always uh, existing in this world as uh, mirages so um, as madam has uh, said that uh, this is the last question i hope i would have satisfied it was really a very nice time for a uh, pleasurable and enjoyable one for me to interact all of you too. and the, i thank once again the organizers for giving me the nice opportunity for to share my few ideas or my ideas on translation as a polyphonic problem thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity ma'am so we would like to thank you once again for your extraordinary presentation sir thank dear you, participants you are requested to join at 1:45 pm for today's afternoon session you are requested to join at 1:45 pm for today's afternoon session now let's break for lunch thank you thank you
Sir, would you like to say no, no, ma'am, no, no, ma'am. Sorry, sorry, I have a technical problem. Okay, sir. thank you, sir. Yes.